Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. Today, we're launching a brand new series of episodes on the show that will be airing over the next few weeks. And that series is called The Dark Side of Municipal Affairs. Now, we will be exploring the dark side of municipal politics with a particular focus on the abuse and harassment faced by municipal officials from across Canada. In today's episode, we are shining a spotlight on the unique challenges confronted by female municipal leaders as they navigate their roles as elected officials. These leaders can often encounter an array of abusive behaviors or harassment from both the public and from within the municipal sector itself, making their professional journeys particularly arduous. Our discussion today will delve into the personal experiences of these three remarkable leaders, all who have, in one way or another, faced such adversities head on. We will hear their stories, understand the nature and extent of the harassment they have endured, and learn about strategies they've employed to combat these issues. The questions guiding our conversations are designed to provide a comprehensive understanding, but please note, we are only one source that can help combat this issue. So joining us for this insightful discussion and roundtable discussion are former Deputy Mayor of the Town of Whitless Bay, Newfoundland and Labrador, Mona Yard, Councillor for the Town of Elmer, Ontario, Catherine DeRosier, and Mayor of the Town of Georgina, Ontario, Margaret Quirk. These leaders bring a wealth of experience and resilience to our conversation. Through their candid reflections, we aim to shed light on the systematic issues of abuse in municipal politics and governance, and explore potential pathways to a safer, more supportive environment for all officials across Canada. So with that, let's go and welcome to Municipal Affairs, the dark side of politics. Mayor, Councillor, former Deputy Mayor, I want to thank you all for sitting down with me and talking about this very important topic of about abuse in the municipal sector. Before we get into the uh, interview, for those who are listening, they do not get to see what you look like, so they won't be able to see who's on the screen. So I'm going to get you to all introduce yourself in a brief elevator pitch, if you don't mind, uh, starting with the people who, uh, but, but basically by the how you appeared in the Zoom call. So we'll head to Georgina, Ontario first with Mayor Quirk. Over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Margaret Quirk, uh, mayor of uh, the beautiful town of Georgina. We're on the shores of Lake Simcoe, just about an hour north of Toronto, part of York Region. Our population is just around 50,000. Um, I was elected first as a ward councillor in 1994, and I served uh, for 16 years as a ward councillor, decided to take a term off. And in 2010, I decided to, in 2014, I decided to return and seek the position of mayor. I was elected um, in 2014, and I'm serving my third term as mayor currently now. Thank you so much, Your Worship Mayor. Uh, Catherine de Rosier from the great town of Elmer, over to you. Yes, my name is Catherine de Rosier. I'm a town councillor here in Elmer, Ontario. We're located at the southest portion or south portion of uh, Ontario in Elgin County, right along Lake Erie beautiful, beautiful rural countryside here. And I'm a counselor in a rural urban town, I would classify it. It's it's a small town, um, populations just around, I think hovering around 8,000 right now. And I've been in office since 2022. I was first elected then. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly fresh. This, I'm in my second year of my first term of uh, municipal office. Thank you so much, Councillor. And last to Newfoundland and Labrador, to the town of Whitless Bay, uh, former Deputy Mayor Lorna Yard. Hey, Chris. Thanks so much for inviting me to participate today. Um, my name is Lorna Yard, and I am the former Deputy Mayor of the town of Whitless Bay. I served for about two and a half years. Um, Whitless Bay is about a half an hour outside of the capital city of St. John's. And it's an absolutely incredible town. We're home to the famous Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve, home of the largest colony of North Atlantic puffins in North America. And we have tremendous assets in terms of trails, um, the ecological reserve, whale watching. It's, it's a spectacular place. 
I was elected in 2021 in the largest voter turnout our town has ever had. Um, my mother was actually the first town clerk of the town of Whittles Bay and its incorporation in 1986 until she passed away at the age of 55 in 1999. My father was a member of the first town council in 1986. And so I guess municipal politics is something I come by quite honestly. And um, yeah, so we're a town of about 1600 people. We're not a big town, but it's a vibrant growing town and it's it's a fantastic place. Well, I appreciate all three of you for sitting down and talking about this subject that is becoming more and more of an issue every single day. Earlier this morning, actually, as we're recording this, the mayor of uh, Ottawa, the capital of Canada, uh, made a news by saying that he was appalled by some of the attacks by on one of his counselors, the abuse and harassment that she was receiving because she had come forward saying that she was being harassed because from what she felt was that she was a Franco-Ontarian uh, being elected. And this is just one story of many that we're hearing on a reoccurring basis. And it's not just from the public, it's also internally from the municipal sector as well. We're seeing the rise of harassment and bullying and abuse in the municipal sector. I want to... I want you to tell your story if you can, and and I don't want to say keep it short, but uh, you can go into details if you wish, if that is your preference. Uh, but for all three of you who I've chatted with, either through social media or through our my other show, Cross Border Interviews, I know you've all faced abuse, harassment in the municipal sector, starting with you, Councillor. Can you explain to the listeners, to the viewers, how you have faced harassment in the municipal sector? Yes, absolutely. So my situation is unique in a sense, I think. There's various forms of harassment and bullying. There's some external, there's some internal. Um, I've been very blessed that my constituents have been nothing but supportive and um, I haven't faced any online harassment from residents or, you know, un unidentified individuals. It's, it's really been internal in my situation. I think a lot of it has to do with my age, um, possibly my gender as well. It's you know, it, it varies in forms of microaggression, such as, you know, deliberate exclusion, uh, being disregarded or intentionally overlooked, and other forms of passive aggressive behavior. In terms of micro or macroaggression, which is obviously more severe, um, I've experienced psychological harassment in forms of bullying and attempted intimidation. So specific inv individuals are utilizing their positions to specifically direct, attempt to influence my vote and other council members' votes, manipulate, coerce, and penalize, in turn in and, and in turn penalize individuals for their resistance to comply. So it's it's been a an experience for sure. It's something when I first entered my term, you hear stories about it all the time. I'm a very optimistic person. So I like to think that in a small town like this, things like that wouldn't happen, but they do. And I think moving forward, I think being open about it and discussing it will better prepare other individuals to learn from our experiences to better prepare themselves for their experiences because i think it's the classic you know prepare for the worst hope for the best so you know prepare for it to possibly occur and if it doesn't great but at least you've you've heard of these situations happening and you've heard of our experiences and how we deal with them and hopefully they can take away lessons from these experiences so i think that's kind of the cold notes of mine um what makes mine also interesting is that you know, here in Ontario, we are supposed to have integrity commissioners, which are responsible for preventing and investigating ethic violations. And in my specific situation, not only was the case mishandled, but it was essentially disregarded. 
and early in the investigation when this was happening to me and I was having these interactions with this individual and with the investigator, you know, something felt off. It wasn't until my husband encouraged me to look into it that he, that I found that this was a habitual behavior. So this investigator who was investigating my case has done the same mishandled cases and disregarded other women right here in Ontario who have brought forth cases of harassment. So um, that was also something that was a complete shock to me. And, and I thought that we had these these individuals and in, in these these roles in place to protect municipal councillors. And then the situation unfolded like this. So I, for me, it was a double whammy. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty and candor there, Councillor, a deputy, a former deputy mayor. Um, I'm not speaking at a turn here, and hopefully I'm not. And if I am, please tell me to just cut this part out, and I will. But you, your harassment got to the point where you actually did resign from council because you didn't feel in your resignation letter that you weren't getting the proper support from council or anyone it seemed like i don't want to say anyone but you weren't getting the support that you needed can you explain to the viewers and listeners the abuse harassment bullying that you received as an elected official in your community sure um you know as catherine said it wasn't something i really anticipated i expected there would be some and i guess to put it in context my journey to volunteering for the municipal sector was was very long, had a lot of twists and turns. As I mentioned, my mom was the original town clerk and she, I witnessed her go through a lot of harassment and abuse. And she was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 45. And I'm not saying the harassment and abuse killed her, but I, I did witness how that really impacted her ability to navigate her health and well being. And so for many years, I, would never even consider entering municipal politics because, because of my experience then, and this is long before the internet. Um, but that all changed in 2010. There's a dark coastline in my town called Ragged Beach, and it's directly across from the famous Whitlands Bay Ecological Reserve that I mentioned. And it's well documented about the impact of artificial lighting on migrating seabirds. And, and like a lot of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, I feel very attached to my natural environment. And so when there was a proposal of development in that area, I knew I couldn't stand back anymore. I knew I had to get involved in my community and advocating for my town. And so for many years, I was a strong advocate to protect that area. And so along the way, you can imagine when you're an environmentalist, I guess that's what I'd call myself. I'd call myself whatever, but that's the, the tag I got. And when you're fighting big money and big development, you make enemies. And so I did make enemies, not intentionally, but that happened. So for me, the harassment and the abuse started before I was even elected. When I, like I said, I was 20 years, almost 20 years thinking, I would love to participate in municipal politics. I would love to contribute to my town. Never really had the confidence, didn't know if people in the town would want me there because of my advocacy for this dark coastline. And I always said, maybe if the time is right, I'll do it. And in 2021, the town had been in disarray then for some point. I mean, to the point where the town didn't even have any staff. And so I just felt like the time was right. So I rallied a group around me and I said, guys, come on, let's, this town is too beautiful and too wonderful to let happen what's happening. So we ran and I was really excited and optimistic, like Catherine said, and I went into it with the best of intentions. And for me, the abuse and the harassment started before I was even elected. As soon as my name went down that ballot, there was a whole Facebook page created whose only purpose was to abuse, harass, and defame me and to keep me from getting elected. And thankfully, the people of Whittles Bay, I mean, it's humbling. We had the biggest voter turnout in our history. They came out and they put us in and they said, listen, we're going to trust you guys. We want change. And so we got elected. And as I said, when we got elected, we had to break into the town office with Walmart card. We didn't even have a key. And it was such a challenge. Like, forget orientation, forget handbooks, forget any of that. Our first meeting was council sitting around a table saying, how are we going to get a town clerk to take minutes for a meeting? Like, that's how we started. 
But I really respected and had a lot of faith in my colleagues and council as people, as individuals. I know they were all there for the right reasons. I have no doubt about that. And I figured we'd get through it together. But over the next while, the abuse and the harassment ramped up so much. And, you know, I took time off work. I did everything I could to get temporary staff to make sure the bills were paid. I mean, it was an incredible situation to be in. And as I'm trying to do this, the abuse and the harassment is ramping up so much that, like I said, it wasn't just a comment online. It was whole Facebook pages. They made false complaints to my place of employment to try to get me in trouble. There were complaints to CRA that I had a little candle business, which, by the way, I claim. Um, it just, it was relentless. And it got to the point where I actually... Um, I went to a lawyer and I said, can you evaluate this online activity? And he said, you know, it's completely defamatory. He said, but more than that, Lorna, he said, I'm really worried for your safety. He said, these people are obsessed with you. And all of it comes back to this advocacy to protect that dark coastline and stop development. And so I ended up having to call the RCMP a number of times. I was confronted in person, at work, in public. Um, it got to the point where I was afraid for my safety and the police advised me that yes it's bordering on criminal harassment you should probably file for restraining orders and throughout this whole time you know I begged anybody for help because like I said it had taken me so long to work up the courage to run I didn't want to walk away and I was so appreciative of all the people who voted for me and um, I wanted to see out my term but there was no help. There was no help. Uh, like my own council distanced themselves from me. They didn't want to be a target by association. I went to the Department of Municipal Affairs. I went to MNL. I went to academics at the university where I work. I went to everybody and I said, somebody, please help me figure out how to stay in this space. And there was just, I uh, there was nothing. And it's not like I'm a very strong person. But it got to the point where it was really negatively affecting my family and my friends. And it got really bad. And the only thing that kept me going was lying as it did was there's so many amazing people in this community. I worked with the fire department. They were incredible. So many people tried to hold me up through this. But it just got to the point where, you know, it was me or them. I appreciate your honesty and candor as well. Um, Mayor Quirk, for yourself, um, being someone who's been elected for some time now, um, have you faced your fair share of harassment or bullying or intimidation tactics uh, towards you as a mayor of your community in your term? Thanks, Chris. And, and certainly um, the two stories I've just listened to, I, I find totally incredible. Um, you know, it, it's hard to believe when it's happening to you, but both of you have lived quite a, an interesting uh, couple of years. And and I'm, I'm sorry you both experienced this because you're both relatively new to being elected officials. And as you said, people were saying to you, you know, about running, don't run. And you were concerned about running and lo and behold, look what, what happened to you. So, you know, my situation in terms of being elected since 1994, I, I've been elected since before there was even email. My first email address on my business card was my personal email address. So back in the day, it was, they wrote you a nasty letter and put it in the mailbox. So um, it's come a long way. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've certainly had some rude, aggressive, disrespectful, vulgar emails, voicemails, um, somewhat threatening emails in terms of depicting things that are maybe kind of violent or suggestion of, of violence or linking to other sites. Um, you know, political cartoons, caricatures of me, and maybe not the most flattering pictures doing, outlining decisions made of council, maybe and not the less, the more complimentary or twisting the, um, the, the version to make it look funny or to, uh, to be more than what it was. Um, anonymous letters to my office, anonymous letters to my home, a disrespectful song made up about me. That, that was a good one. Um, usually they aren't face-to-face. -face. And for some of you, it sounds like some of yours have been face-to-face. -face. Most of mine have been within that protection, that keyboard warrior that likes to 
go on and, and say a lot of things. And yet when you see them in person, they don't act like that. I've knocked on people's doors that have been extremely rude about me, to me personally on social media sites. And when I introduce myself to them, and I know that they've been the person that has posted things and I'll ask them, you know, have any questions? Silence. No, no, everything's good. Everything's good. So um, very much keyboard warriors. That's that level. But then there is the next level. And I don't know if any of you have experienced it, but uh, certainly some of the, there's the typical, I'm not happy that uh, my garbage didn't get picked up. I'm, I'm mad that my road didn't get plowed enough or is being plowed too often. Those are the the standard, you know, emails. They've got more aggressive, but then there's it seems to have built and and got um, a higher level where people will consistently be challenging everything in a in a disrespectful manner. And it I don't say that people can't disagree with us. You can certainly disagree with our decisions, not like a tax increase, not like, you know, a decision we made about some facility or some service. But there's that line that that typically you you don't cross in terms of a constructive conversation. And many people are now going beyond that constructive conversation and going right to swearing at you. Um, you know, when the subject line is you're stupid, kind of tells you the tone of what the email is going to be so that's been more of of my experience of of the social media the emails the voicemails fairly limited in terms of the confrontation in person um, so I certainly sympathize with uh, with my two colleagues here um, and what they've experienced I, I appreciate all three of you being honest and open about what you've gone through in your time in elected politics I'm gonna start the sort of open discussion part of the episode now. And I'm going to, I hate that I have to ask this question, but I need to, to kick it off because I know the moment this episode airs, I will get emails saying it's a bunch of women. They just need to man up. They just need to <laughs> take it because that's what they signed up for. You are elected. You do, you, the good comes with the bad and the bad is you have to deal with some criticism. You have to deal with harassment possibly because your male colleagues will potentially be dealing with the same thing. How do you respond to that? How do you respond that? You know what? Yes, I am a woman, but it's not right in your words or anyone wants to take this to lead off with. How do you respond to you're just a woman you just need to man up. It's not the fact that you're a woman that we're attacking you. It's you're an elected official. Just deal with it. Who wants to take that? I don't mind. Oh, no. Sorry. Go ahead, oh, Kat. No, go ahead. No, you, you were first. You go ahead. Well, to be honest, um, what I have found in my experience is that I had some residents come at me pretty angry about things. And if I said, okay, let me explain it to you. And if you take the time to explain something to somebody and you have a conversation, 100% of the time, in my experience, we came out of it with a good understanding. So it's not about taking criticism. I don't mind taking criticism at all. But it's when people want to attack and destroy and hurt you. Those are the things that are not acceptable. And I don't know why it is, but in my case, I found that my male counterparts, maybe it's because people don't assume that they're emotional feeling beings like women are. I have no idea, but they were never subject to the personal nasty attacks that I was. And like I said, you can go ahead, criticize any decision I make. I have no problem with that and I'll defend it. And if I do something wrong, I'm the first one to hold my hands up and say, well, I thought that was a good decision, but I'll agree with you. Maybe I need to rethink that. I have no issue with that. But like I said, when, when, the criticism I was subject to wasn't about policy or decisions. It was dragging my deceased parents into it. It was about calling me, you know, corrupt and mentally ill and an alcoholic and all these things that, like, that's not criticism. That's text. I would firstly agree with everything Warner just said. Um, I think it was absolutely 100% correct. Um with me specifically, I think anyone who genuinely knows me, like knows me 
you know, as a friend, as a family member, as an acquaintance, I am a very like tough person. And I always uh, attest it to, I come from a Dutch background, like a Dutch family. And if anybody has any Dutch friends or relatives or like that, they're very outspoken and they can be to the point where it's almost insulting. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you develop a tough skin very early on. That's all I could say. I love my family to death, but very, very tough skin. So uh, that, and then I also was a property manager in my earlier career. So I was a property manager. I had various tenants and, you know, I had those tenants calling me screaming about something or, or, you know, um, swearing at me. So I've had that experience and I'm um, surprisingly like, okay with it. I can, I can handle that. What I can't handle is someone abusing their position to specifically control like it's with me it's a it's a matter of ethics and morals because I feel like in a democracy you know every every individual every counselor is entitled to their independent thought and to their vote so when someone steps in and utilizes their position to manipulate or intimidate a member of council regardless of sex this the same individual has done it to males as well so it's, it's not about sex it's not about gender um the microaggression that i experienced as far as like uh disregarding me and intentionally excluding me that's that has more to do with gender because it's the typical classical old boys club that are pushing me out because i'm new and i'm young and possibly a woman but as far as being tough and being able to handle it you know other other members other colleagues are experiencing the same intimidation bullying harassment that I am um and and it's they're not just women so I I think it has nothing to do with gender specifically I think it has to do with control and power and those individuals uh abusing that power and and that's not okay I'll jump in and and certainly after the number of years I've I've been on on council and in politics, uh, you do develop a, a thick skin and you do get people saying, well, you know, you signed up for this and and this is part of the the job and and that's true to a certain point, um, but what's happened is is the aggression has got more and I've seen it not just against me as a as a female mayor or a female member of council but I've seen it increase against all members of, of council um, no matter their their gender or 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 their age people are just angrier and feel more um, emboldened to to post those messages to send those emails to do those cartoons to do those um you know Facebook groups and pages and comments that um, are anti-government or anti whatever they're they're angry uh, about so in some regards i don't think some of it isn't because i'm a woman but there is that element and we all know that the, that there is that element that that exists that you know is out there that um uh, the same quality in a woman versus the same quality in a man a woman you're a i won't use the b word but you're that word if if you're but if you're a man, oh, you're just, you know, um, you know, a strong leader and and you're, you know, dynamic and stuff. But to a woman, the quality is is labeled differently for some people. Um, so I haven't experienced it because I'm a woman, I don't believe for the majority of the case, there there are a few that I I believe are misogynistic comments and passive aggressive comments that that they would not say or do if if I was a uh, a male mayor and not a, a female mayor. But the vast majority, because I'm I've been on council, well the first sixteen years I was the only woman on on council. Um, since I've been mayor, um, I've had other female members of council up until this term of council where we're a, a council of seven, we have four women. So we actually, this is the first time that we actually outnumber the men, which it's not a numbers game, but that's that's our reality. And, and it's good because the the world isn't all female, the world isn't all male. So it's good to have that that mixture. But I don't think the majority of my experiences are because I'm a I'm a woman but certainly there's an element of that now but I'm for, tough. all three of you are tough I don't care who's watching this or listening to this who don't think you are you are tough you all are all tough with that being said I want to talk about 
the pressure that the challenges the challenges that you have all faced in your roles has led to for you former deputy mayor you, you resigned because it got to a point where you there was no path forward. I don't want to say there was no path forward, but there was no support systems in place. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the councillor or the mayor on this one, if possible. But in your time dealing this with this harassment, intimidation, bullying, uh, notes for you, mayor, even a song written about you, was there ever a point in time or has there come a point in time when you say, this is not what I signed up for. This has gotten to a point where I just need to either walk away or keep my head down because I'm sick and tired of dealing with the harassment, the bullying, the intimidation. And I I, I could be out making a lot more money in a different sector if I chose to. Uh, Mayor, counselor, who wants to take that one first? I'll let Catherine, because I think she's experienced a few things more than I have on this, but I'll weigh in later. Uh, for me, sadly, like asking that question, is this what I signed up for? Initially, no, I signed up because I was noticing, I was recognizing deficiencies within my town, and I wanted to be at the table to either understand why those deficiencies were happening, or secondly, to possibly correct them and make make our town better. So this situation specifically has opened my eyes to why there are certain deficiencies within our town because situations like this are happening. So although it's not what I signed up for, now recognizing that it's an issue and it's it's been an issue and and could potentially continue to be an issue if somebody doesn't step up and do something, this is what I signed up for, because I just want to make my community a better place, make it somewhere that we're proud to, to live. It's healthy, uh, inclusive. Um, people want to live here, want to raise their families here. So if these are the issues that our town is facing, whether it's behind closed doors or not, I'm ready to take it on and hopefully make it better. And if, it, like I said, if it's not initially what I signed up for, I'm not backing away now. That's for sure. Yourself, Mayor? Well, certainly there there are days when you wake up and you think, you know, what am I doing? We all have those in any job. But the reality is I, I still love doing what I'm doing. And at times it, it, it almost makes you want to continue on even further because you, you, you say that, they're not going to get me down just because there's somebody out there, you know, that isn't happy. Um, there's many more that are. And I get more of those comments more and more, as well as the increase in the unkind and, and disrespectful emails and Facebook posts and, you know, groups that, that uh, will go at you. When I'm talking to residents, they're very complimentary and they're saying, I really hope you're going to run next time. I really hope you don't, I really hope you don't let, some of these naysayers get to you because that's not the way the majority thinks that we we think you're doing a good job because we know that especially for the online there's the bullying online that if somebody goes in and says something positive about a, a decision or a member of council or whatever they get attacked they get attacked by the bullies so there's people that are afraid on social media to stand up for their their local politicians but they'll do it to you in your in face to face they'll say Margaret, you, you got to run next time. You can't let some of these uh, comments uh, get you down, you know, and and that gives me strength and that gives me the the ability to say, yeah, you know what? I'm sticking around. I, I'll be here next time. I, I want to continue on on this role because you can't let a few. And we all know like we again, we're a community of 50,000. We have some social media groups that have 10 to 15,000 members on their Facebook groups. But how many actually post, how many post negative things, and how many are the, the constant, you know, ones that that uh, are in there stirring the pot? The vast majority are, as I call it, sitting back eating the popcorn, watching, you know, the, the story unfold in front of them, not wanting to comment at times because they're, they're afraid of being attacked. So it, it's the vast majority are the silent majority that will come up to you and have that that really constructive uh, dialogue that Lauren was saying, that if you don't understand or you don't agree with an issue, 
sit down with us, talk to us. And they may not at the end of the day agree with what the decision was, but they come away with a better understanding. But we all know that many of these people that are out there that are, are constantly, you know, going against, you know, the decisions, they don't want the facts. You give them the facts and they don't like the facts because the facts don't suit and don't match their narrative. So they don't care. I mean, the answer is the answer. I can't change the answer. And you, none of us can change the answer on the concern that, that they have because we're giving them the facts. They don't like the facts. But probably 95% of the people you talk to, when you sit down one-on-one -on -one and hear their concern, answer their question, they go away satisfied with understanding more, maybe changing their opinion if they're that kind of person that can actually say, yeah, you know what? I, I didn't have that side of it but there always will be the element that they don't care about the facts. It doesn't fit their narrative and they'll continue to put out misinformation and, and do the, um, the aggressive and uh, disrespectful comments back and forth. So. Uh, for yourself, former mayor, a deputy mayor. Oh, oh, actually, no, go ahead, Catherine, before I throw it over to. Uh, I was just, mayor. I was going to touch on, on um, what mayor Margaret go was for, just mentioning. Go for it. Yeah, just really quickly that uh, her having those constituents come up to her on the street and say, hey, I, I understand what you're going through and I've been reading about it or hearing about it. I just want, you know, you've got to run again or you've got to keep going, like good for you. And that's one thing I said that this at the beginning of the podcast that my constituents have been nothing but supportive and we have a local paper here. They've been, re they reported on the entire situation uh, very unbiasedly and you know, made sure that our constituents were informed about what was going on. And I have had nothing but the utmost support. And that really makes, like, it really makes a difference when they come and they they voice that to you. And because it's not, you're not just hearing the bad or, or experiencing the bad, you're also experiencing the good as well. So it is really gratifying to have that support from your constituents. We're going to talk about the good, and I know that's a weird uh, oxymoron talking about the good when you're talking about abuse and ho online harassment, but we're going to talk about the flip side of this in two seconds. But former Deputy Mayor, you made the tough choice to resign from that council position. Um, now, I saw the outpouring of support from your community and from surrounding communities that you had when you made that announcement on social media. But I want to talk about the moment you made that in your mind. What was that moment like for yourself? And I hopefully I'm not going to bring up any, uh, uh, anything bad here. And if you don't want to talk about it, please just tell me to move on. But that thought process must have been quite difficult for yourself because you seem like you want the best for your community and then you turn around and say I can't it was heartbreaking to be honest and um you know it kind of I think it kind of reflects back to your earlier question about you know they say women need to develop tougher skin and that kind of thing I don't want to generalize but I think inherently women are nurturers and caregivers and for me, the decision came because of the impact it was having on my friends and family. I'm fiercely loyal. I will never let anybody hurt any of them. And, and an interesting thing is that um, last August, when the abuse and the harassment was at its worst, um, we just happened to have a by-election here in town. And my husband, who's not from Whitless Bay and who never had any inclination to run for municipal politics, politics really surprised me one day. He said, I'm going to run. And I said, you're what? He said, no, I'm going to run. He said, because I know how much this means to you. And I know how much you want to finish this term. And I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with you. And he said, no, I'm not just going to warm a seat. He said, I'm going to do my work and we'll probably disagree. And I'm going to be my own individual person. But he said, I want you to be able to see this term through because I know it's something you built up to your whole life. So I'm going to do it. And he did. And he ran. And when they couldn't get to me, they started to go after him to try to get to me. And they went after him professionally. They went after him personally. And as I mentioned earlier, when my mom was the town clerk, um, she was diagnosed with cancer at a young age and all the stress didn't help. The defining moment for me was um, a member of my family. Like my family never wanted me to run because of what her experience was. And it was a really difficult experience 
A family member came to me shortly before I resigned. And what he said is his perspective, so I'm not going to change his words. But what he said to me was, like, I'm 54. My mother was 55 when she died. So when you're getting to the age a parent died, like, you reflect and you're thinking about that. <clears throat> and he said to me, I'll never forget it. He looked me in the eye and he said, this place put your mother in the ground. Are you going to let it do it to you? And I didn't, like, I didn't feel that that was the outcome. But it was at that moment I realized the impact it was having on everybody around me. And they were so worried and I wasn't myself. And, you know, it was a really difficult time. And even like I was the fire department liaison and the fire chief is incredible. He's like 26 years old and his awareness of mental health and gender issues. Like he just, he, he, he amazed me every day. And even he came to me and he said, I'm not commenting on what your decision is, but I'm worried about you. And so when everybody around me started to express this and I saw the pain they had, there was no choice. I'm sorry you had to go through that. And side tangent here for just two seconds and I hope you indulge me. Uh, my my husband, former minister of tourism in the province of Alberta, faced his fair share of online harassment. And in when I got married to him, we announced it. And the online abuse that I started to receive after that was horrible. And I and I get that family is together and they're doing this together as you as elected officials but my one hope for people listening to this or people in this world stop attacking the families they didn't sign up for this they didn't put their name on the ballots don't do that that's just stupid when i hear stories about kids being involved now and kids being targeted of politicians just stop that being said and i want to talk about what we can do as a society. And I'm going to ask the kind of million dollar question that is this entire inter this entire thing. How do we get better? How does this get better? How do we as a society, as elected officials, as people across this can a country, turn a new page of this book and stop attacking people? Because Social media has been created and they feel like they are entitled now to say whatever they want without any consequences. The old boys club is still around and it's going to be around for some time now. What would you want to see as elected officials, as formerly elected officials, that would help curb what you've gone through so the next generation of municipal leaders don't have to face the same thing that you are going through? I'm going to start with uh, Margaret on this one, if uh, if you don't mind. <laughs> no problem. And that's a huge, huge question. And it's something I think a number of us have, have tried to answer. Um, we actually, as a municipality, um, in last year, in the spring, we put out a, um, uh, a media release about bullying of our hound staff on online and calling it out and saying it's not acceptable that, you know, you wouldn't want those comments made about your, you know, son, daughter, wife, husband, and and yet they, they seem acceptable to to be posted. And this is more about staff than, than about the elected officials. So, and we said, there's nothing we can do as a municipality to, to stop that harassment on social media. If somebody is sending our staff harassing emails, there's ways we can we can deal with with that. But on social media, it's that, as we say, that free for all. So I think we have to, as a society, man up in terms of being that person that that does step up and takes the risk of saying something online that they're going to get attacked for when they're defending somebody. So when you see the online bullying, it's no different than seeing the bullying that can happen in a schoolyard, in a workplace, at a social function, at your family dinner, where you, you stand up and say, no, you, you can't say that to, to so-and-so. You can't, you can't say that. It's not appropriate. That's wrong. That's disrespectful. So I think we have to 
somehow, and that's the big question, how do we do that? How do we get people to, to um, feel comfortable and strong enough to be that person that on a social media site, and we'll, we'll target that at this point, because that's where the public, you know, tend to gather. It used to be at the, the general store or the Tim Hortons, and it still is at the Tim Hortons, but, but now those Tim Horton conversations are getting transposed onto social media and becoming, you know, very rude. And, and some people do it on purpose just to stir the pot to see what can happen. But I don't know if there's a definitive answer, but I think we have to, to start setting boundaries within our, our own lives um, on social media. I know I do. I, I'm right up front on both of my social media pages, my personal one and my mayor one, which I administer myself. I don't have staff to do that. And I set boundaries that I will not get into a back and forth on social media. I will not respond to to tags, you know, hashtag tag the mayor on some social media group. I won't respond to Facebook private messages other than to say, send me an email and I'll involve staff. So I think we have to set boundaries and we have to let those boundaries be known and and to provide support to um to our staff to be able to to have that feeling that we support them and i think it grows out into the community and having people that that you know that are influencers in the community whether they're the people that run some of the social facebook social you know the facebook groups um to 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 be strict on on the issues and if somebody wants to to run a group that lets all sorts of things be said fine fill your boots go over there but on my page and on on my personal page and my town mayor page, I don't let that sort of conversation happen because it it just gets very disrespectful. I'll answer questions. Um, I'll get questions answered by by staff if it's required, but there's no easy answer. There's no quick fix on this because this is societal. This is not just if this can happen in a small community of Whitless Bay of 1,600 people. And in a mid-sized, you know, community of, of around 8,000 in Aylmer, and in my community of 50,000, and I've seen it in communities bigger and smaller, it's everywhere. It's pervasive. So I don't know. There is no easy answer, except maybe we have to start teaching our children better so that that they will grow up to be kinder and gentler people, that when they have a disagreement, they don't immediately, the default isn't aggression and disrespect and intimidation and bullying, but no easy answer. Um, former Deputy Mayor Yard, what about yourself? Um, I, I don't know how to properly ask the question, but how can we fix this? How can we fix that you're the next generation of yards who decide I'm going to do what Lorna did, decides to put their name on the ballot, do not have the same experience that your mother did and what you did? I think the key is solidarity. And, you know, even through my experience, as tough as it was, I still <laughs> love the community. There's so many amazing people here. It's just something I experienced. And that's why I'm talking to you guys today, because I hope we can learn from it and make it better for other people. And I think we can. And before I resigned, I was actually working with an academic at the university where I work, Memorial. And she has done a lot of mediation. Um, she addresses code of conduct complaints. So she has expertise in the area. And I went to her and I said, you know, what do we do? And so we started to do some research. And actually, I had planned to try to prepare a toolkit to present to the municipalities in Newfoundland Labrador to see if they could go further with it and train CAOs and councils. Because the biggest issue I had, if I had any support, I could have made it. But I mean, I had comments made to me by my colleagues on council saying, you know, as long as they're after you, they're leaving me alone and things like that. That's what we have to change because you can't change the internet. You're never gonna change it. But in some of our research, the things we looked at, for example, if an account is being abusive or hateful, if I learn a year on Facebook report it, yeah, Facebook are going to be like, so what? But if the town of Whitless Bay reports it as an organization, they have more credibility. Things like, you know, you check in with people to see how things are going. You don't blame people who are being harassed. If it gets really bad, the town can release a statement because don't forget the people who are sharing and commenting and saying things about your family and you and all this, they're your neighbors. They're what, like in a town of 1,600 people, 
They're walking down the road when you're mowing your lawn. And one of the biggest challenges I had was that I found it difficult to attend community events. At the time, our mayor was out of town with work for that. So I was expected to represent him, which I had no problem doing. But it was hard and intimidating to go to those events when you know the same people who are ripping you apart <laughs> in probably 50 people. They're going to be one of them. You know what I mean? And then when I said to the town, I'm having problems fulfilling my obligations. It was like, well, you're a poor excuse for a deputy mayor. So it's <laughs> internal. You know what I mean? It's internally. There has to be solidarity. There has to be support. And it's not rocket science. There are things that we can do as long as we recognize you're never going to control the internet. Forget that. Focus on support, solidarity, engage academics. And I know people would say, oh, my God, the academics still read a 100-page paper. No, they have expertise. They have experience. You know what I mean? I would love to see this province develop a toolkit and training program for councils and administrators to say, when this happens, here's how you support the person. And I think that could really, really go a long way. I appreciate that. Counselor, besides the background change that we just had, <laughs> um, I got to ask, how do we knock down the old boys club? Saying that as the man in the group chat right now, how do we break down the old boys club? So that way the next generations of DeRosiers can go up and be a strong, powerful voice like their mother has been. Oh, that's so sweet. And I apologize. My connection was, I don't know what was going on. It was coming in and out. I think something to do with my modem location. So that's why I moved just part of the, the glamor of having a, a live podcast, I guess. Um, what can we do? So I don't want to seem pessimistic, but personally, I think it's it's human nature. I don't think this behavior is ever going to go away. So for me, it's like, what can we do to fix it? Well, for sure, like recognizing the behavior. So being cognizant of it, ex like expecting it, um, unfortunately, and understanding understanding the motive behind the behavior as as well, I think is really good to to reflect on and to under to really understand it better. Uh, as Mayor Quirk said, you know, setting those boundaries, like setting those boundaries are so important and um, doing that early on within, earlier on within your municipal career. Uh, and then what Lorna said about, you know, um, mentoring others, like, I think that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. So not only speaking up about the abuse and harassment and making sure people are aware that it is a, it is a possibility, unfortunately, that you could come into contact with, but then being there as a mentor for other counselors uh, or people that want to step up into this career and say, you know, hey, like this could happen and it's unfortunate that it does. It may not happen, but if it does learn from, you know, my experience or or, or let me help you and mentor you to work through the, the experience and the situation um, in the best way possible. So I think having those having those mentors available and and you know maybe even having it as a program like those are really really i think taking the situation and learning from it like that's all you can really do in life you know is 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 try for try for the best and if anything happens like this unfortunately is is leaning on others who who are there to mentor you and and help you work through the situation we are at the 45 minute mark and I want to start wrapping up. But before I do that, I'm, I saw the hand raised from the former deputy mayor. So I'm going to throw it back to her for yeah, one last word. And to, then I go ahead. I just wanted to make a quick comment that even though my experience was pretty tough, um, you know, we're doing well, we're happy. It was the right decision. It was a really hard decision, but I, Willis Bay is a fantastic place. And I don't want people to think that it's full of really negative people. It's like a friend of mine said one time, you get 100% of your problems from 5% of the people. And that's true. Um, you know, I did take away a lot of good things from the opportunity. I got to work with the fire department and we did some really great work. Um, last fall, the provincial government announced the very first of its kind, Crown Land Reserve at Ragged Beach. And so that's been recognized by different organizations. So there was a lot of positive that came out of my time too. The thing that really hurt me the most was all the people who voted for me. I was very sorry that I couldn't fulfill my term, but I've had a lot of really positive feedback and support. And I think the future of the town is really bright. And I think people like you who bring this issue to the forefront, and I know at FCM, there was um, resolutions made about it. And I think working together, the municipal sector can really 
really change this and find ways to help people through it. And so hopefully, like I said, my experience will help that. And I, I look forward to seeing what the further conversations will be. So before I let everyone go, and we kind of are on that page already, but I want to just give you all another brief moment, if you will. What's one thing you hope people take away from your story that they can take into their to their own council uh, meetings or their own life as a municipal leader? Because there's always the best practices in municipal politics, right? We always talk about the best practices and what is the best way forward. What's the what's the last word you'd want to leave uh, my audience with, my viewers with? that you hope they take away and say, okay, this is how I have to start thinking. And we're going to go in reverse order as we started. So back over to you, former Deputy Mayor Lorna Yard. I think municipal service is wonderful and it's so rewarding. And I would encourage a lot, like people just consider it because your municipality, the decisions made there are the ones closest to you. And yes, it can be difficult, but the big thing I would tell anybody who is considering uh, to enter the sector is just, Make sure you take care of yourself. Don't be afraid, like, you know, Mayor Quirk said, set boundaries, um, speak up. I think part of, part of my problem was that I tried to suffer in silence for too long. So just take care of yourself. But in the end, it is such a fulfilling thing to do. And I would really encourage anybody who's considering it, just give it a shot. You can always resign. <laughs> <laughs> Counselor, what about yourself? I would say similar to what I said before, you know, expect the behavior, unfortunately, uh, be prepared as best as possible, uh, foster and embrace healthy connections within the industry. Like, although just as uh, our other two roundtable discussion, our members have mentioned, you know, it's not just the bad, like I've made a lot of really great connections within the industry as well, like other municipal counselors, like I've got a really great group of female counselors uh, from around here that we're so close and we lean on each other for, you know, advice and support. So they're really great. I have um, a couple of, it's not, and not just the old boys too, because a neighboring municipality has two older boys, technically, as, if you label them, um, who are the opposite. They're so supportive. They're so fun. They're so encouraging and they really motivate me. So um, fostering and embracing those healthy connections. They're, they're, it's so important to have that village, whatever that village may be. Be open, as Lorna said about it, like don't suffer in silence and and make sure you are vocal about what's going on to either you know, have people be aware or, or prepare others for, you know, their interactions that they have and stay true to your morals, like, like stay true to you and, and listen to your morals and your ethics. And at the end of the day, if you stick by that, um, nobody can fault you for that. Couldn't agree more. Last word to you, Mayor Quirk. How about yourself? Well, well, certainly I, I agree with much as what's been said by uh, my two colleagues. And I think it's important to have that strong team around you, whether it's family, whether it's other members of council, whether it's staff, um, you need that support group because there will be times that, uh, you know, there's, you know, negative comments, issues that are happening. And you need to be able to to vent and to get solutions. And uh, as I say, you, you try to set the boundaries to make sure that that um, you you put out there what you're going to do, how to communicate with you, what type of uh, language you'll accept and, and what type of language you won't accept and and how that uh, should be dealt with in a in a fulsome manner around council in terms of getting the support from the other members of council, which I'm fortunate to have, members of, of staff fortunate to have. Um, so you need that strong team and those boundaries set from, from the get-go. I often joke and I tell people, don't get on Facebook. <laughs> If you're going to run for politics, delete yourself off now, take yourself away from social media, because I think we probably all, I mean, I know I've done it where I've taken a social media break, or you stop following certain groups, or you take yourself, you don't need to be surrounded by the negativity. And as I said before, we have some very large social media groups, but very small numbers that are actually active. So don't feed into the negative is what I would would. Um, to tell people recognize that there's many more positive people out there they're often the quieter ones and the other ones that will come up to you 
um, off to the side and, and and give you support. So don't don't let let them pull you down to that rabbit hole, and and uh, don't sink to their level. And as I think it was Obama when when they go low, I go high, and and that's that's always been been my my mantra that I I try not to get into that um, negative spin. Um, so I just say you know. I like the idea. Stay true to yourself, and to uh, surround yourself by supportive family, friends, council members, and and staff, and and you'll get through it. There's, it goes in cycles. I I often wonder if it's the full moon phases or, you know, what's happening in the states or whatever. But it, it comes and goes, and I think you just need to keep moving forward. Always stay positive. I'm a glass half full kind of person, not glass half empty. Focus on the positive and keep moving forward and, and you'll be successful. I want to take a moment and say thank you to all three of you for coming on this show, coming on this roundtable discussion. I know we, in the last almost hour now, kind of flew by and we talked about some very big macro issues here. This is not the first and it will not, it's the first, but it will not certainly be the last conversation that we have around this issue. Because I think the more and more that we get into this, it's going to be more prevalent in the years to come, if not the weeks and days ahead. I want to thank each and every single one of you for taking time and talking about your stories, about the best practices and how we go forward as a society, but as a municipal sector as well. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And be kind to each other. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of Municipal Affairs. If you can, and if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our great conversations that we have coming up over the next few weeks before our summer hiatus in August, and then our triumphant return with a brand new addition to the show, which you will not want to miss, and it'll be announced at the end of July in September of 2024. If you can, consider backing the show. As you saw today, we continue to want to have great conversations about important issues, and we can't do that without the support of you. Head over to the Cross Border Interviews website and hit the Support the Show link today. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, scroll on down and click the Support the Show link there. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.